This is a sample from our training at itdvds.com. If you'd like to learn more, please go to itdvds.com. When it comes to making DHCP highly available, we've got three main options. The first option is going to be a failover cluster. So this is going to be an active, passive Windows failover cluster where both servers have the DHCP role installed on them and then the configuration data for DHCP is held on shared storage. So this option is nice because we can manually fail over the role to another node in the cluster while we're trying to do maintenance on a particular node in the cluster. Let's say we're running Windows updates, we need to reboot it, as well as we have that automatic failover if one of our nodes crashes. So if you want to learn more about that option, please see the Windows Server 2016 Administration Training Clustering and High Availability on itdvds.com. We go over everything, how to build a failover cluster from scratch and how to install roles and make them highly available in Failover Cluster Manager as well as with PowerShell. So the next two options we're actually going to set up and configure in this training, we've got DHCP Failover. This is where DHCP manages the distribution of IP addresses between two DHCP servers and they actually replicate the lease information between them. Some limitations of DHCP Failover is going to be two servers max to a failover relationship. And we'll see a failover relationship. The nice thing is a DHCP server can actually be members of multiple failover relationships. So we can have one DHCP server being active in one failover relationship, but also passive in another failover rela relationship. Now, it, this only works for IP version 4 scopes, so it doesn't work with for IP version 6. And this is going to be configured at the scope level, which is actually kind of nice, so it's a bit granular. And it's compatible with Windows Server 2012 to Windows Server 2016 servers. There are two modes that we'll see. There's load sharing, which is an active-active setup, and then hot standby, which is an active-passive setup. The next option is going to be split scopes. This is where identical scopes are created on two DHCP servers, but the IP address pool is different and not overlapping. And when we do this, there's actually a nice wizard we can use to set this up. It uses exclusion ranges to make it so that one DHCP server can only hand out a certain uh, amount of IP addresses, certain amount of specific IP addresses, and then the other DHCP server can hand out the rest. Now let's configure DHCP failover. So we can right click on our IP version 4. I'm going to do this on DHCP 01 and go to configure failover. So we're going to configure this by scope and we can do multiple scopes at the same time if we want. You can see by default it's going to select all the scopes. I get to uncheck that and just highlight two scopes for example if that's what I want to do just by holding down control and clicking on them. Or if I just want to do one scope specifically I can always just right click on that scope and go to configure failover. So I'll do it for 192.168.7.0 Let's go ahead and click next. We'll type in the name of the partner server. We could also click on add server and select it. Our partner server is going to be dhcp02.itvscorp.com. So I'll go ahead and click next. Here we're going to specify the relationship name. So each time we create a, a failover relationship, it creates an, a unique name that's actually stored in Active Directory, and the default is going to be the server name that we're setting it up on DHCP01 and then a dash and then the partner server DHCP02. So that works for me. I'm going to go ahead and leave that. It does need to be unique for each failover relationship. And we have a couple options here, maximum client lead time and state switchover interval. We'll talk about those in a second. Those have to do with taking ownership when there's a failure. But first, let's take a look at the modes. We have load balance and hot standby. So load balance is going to be an active active setup where both of our servers, in our case DHCP01 and DHCP02, are going to be serving our DHCP clients. So they're both able to hand out IP addresses. And here we can specify the load balance percentage. So let's say the local server, in our case, since we're setting this up on DHCP01, that's the local. Let's say I want that to carry most of the load, like three-fourths of the load. I can set it at 75%, and then my partner server, DHCP02, carries 25% of the load. So if four requests come in, three of them are going to be served by DHCP01, and one of them are going to be served by DHCP02. But it's active, active, so both servers are actively handing out IP addresses. The other option is going to be hot standby, where we have one server, like DHCP01, doing all the, are handling all the DHCP requests, while DHCP02 
is just sitting there waiting for DHCP01 to fail, and then DHCP02 can take control of the scope. And when we set up hot standby, we specify addresses reserved for the standby server. This is so that the standby server has a certain number of IP addresses just for itself that it can hand out while it's waiting for what was the active server like DHCP01 to go into a partner down state and then for the maximum client lead time to expire. So if we think that 5% isn't enough for you know an hour to go by to handle DHCP clients if there is a failure of our our active server DHCP01 then we might want to increase this so that our standby has enough IP addresses. So now let's talk a little bit more about these two maximum client lead time and state switchover interval. So if there's a failure so let's say we're doing a hot standby here and DHCP01 is our active DHCP server DHCP02 is our standby and again you know, we can figure that here the role of the partner server is standby if we want to make DHCP02 the active one we would just change that to active and then DHCP01 would be the standby but let's let's stick it at DHCP02 is the standby well if DHCP01 has a problem let's say it loses network connection or just completely crashes and goes down then what happened is DHCP01 is going to be put into a communications interrupted state because DHCP02 doesn't have any way to verify what actually happened to DHCP01. It can't contact it. Now if it can contact it and figure out the DHCP server service is just down, then it will be able to put DHCP01 into a partner down state. But right now we're talking about this thing crashed. It has no way to verify what happened to it. So it gets put in a communications interrupted state. Well, we would manually have to go in and put it into a partner down state unless we check this box for state switchover interval. So if we check this and it's in a communications interrupted state for 60 minutes, then it will automatically put DHCP01 into a partner down state. When it's in a partner down state, the maximum client lead time has to expire. So it's going to wait another 60 minutes in our case. And once that time's expired, then DHCP02 will assume full control of the scope. And at that point, basically become the active server. And then DHCP01, of course it's down, will be the passive server, also called the standby. Now the maximum client lead time is also the amount of time that one server can extend a lease for a DHCP client beyond the time known by the partner server. So when there is that loss of communication between DHCP01 and DHCP02, DHCP02 can get people along or get people down the road or DHCP clients by extending the lease out for an hour without DHCP01 knowing about it because most likely DHCP01 is down. Now that also has to do in our load balance scenario whether or not if one of the servers goes down if it's automatically put into that partner down state and if there's that loss of communication the maximum lead time, client lead time comes into play as well as far as the amount of time that the server that's up can extend at least without that communication with our other server. Now when we set up this failover relationship the leases that are handed out by our DHCP server that are replicated back and forth so that each server knows what the other server is doing. And we can ha add a shared secret in here which is like a password so that there is some level of authentication with that replication. Now the replication is encrypted and it uses port 647. When we set this up there's a couple firewall rules that are added. So I'll just go ahead and type in a shared secret and click on next and finish. Okay, and it was completed successfully. Okay, and we go down here and see we might have to refresh. Right click uh, refresh. And there's our scope. So it's now on both these servers, DHCP01 and 02, and they're both actively serving DHCP requests. Let's bring up a, a server or just a desktop in this particular subnet. That's a DHCP client. Okay, there it is. I brought up desktop 205. You can see what IP address it grabbed. And if we go over here and look on DHCP01, 
that lease is there also. So that lease is being replicated. And another thing to note is that if we're using a DHCP relay agent, we want to make sure we have both of these DHCP servers listed. For example, here's my DHCP relay agent. Let's go to the properties. I just have one. I want to be sure and add both of my servers. So my other one is dot two two seven. Now let's go over to desktop two o five. Okay, here we are on desktop 205. I've done an IP config all here, and we can see, okay, it did get that IP address, and the DHCP server is 192.168.6.225. So that's DHCP01. Now let's take DHCP01 down. Now I'm just going to disconnect it from the network. Okay, I've disconnected it from the network. Now let's do an IP config space slash release. So this is going to release its DHCP address. And now let's do a renew. So it's going to try to get an IP address again from a DHCP server. Okay, it was able to get its IP address again. Let's do a IP config space slash all. So we can see now the DHCP server is 192.168.6.227. So the failover worked great. And 227 is DHCP02. So let's go over here and run the git-dhcp server v4 failover, and we're going to run it. We can't get to dhcp01 because it's down, so let's run it against dhcp02. And we can see, okay, here's the name of our failover relationship, the partner server, the mode, uh, the load balance percent for this particular server, dhcp02. And we can see the state is communication interrupted. So because auto state transition is set to true, after 60 minutes go by, this is going to change to partner down. And then when that happens, after the max client lead time expires in another hour, it's this server, DHCP02, is going to assume control of the, the whole scope. And that's mainly going to pertain when we have an active passive set up, when we've got it configured for standby and not load balance. But in a load balance scenario, what it does affect is how long the lease is that it can hand out. So our max lead time is an hour, and if we go over here, and let's take a look at the lease on DHCP02, the lease expiration is 8-7-2017 at 4.05, and I renewed this IP address when we run that IP config space slash renew at 3.05 p.m. So it was just able to extend that lease out an hour because it cannot communicate with DHCP01. And we can also go to the properties of the scope and go over to failover and get this information as well so we can see the state of the server lost contact with partner. Now I'm going to go ahead and bring uh, DHCP01 back up or just connect it back to the network and if we go to the properties here failover we can see okay the state of the server is now normal as well as the partner server. So that happened automatically. So again, the important thing to know that is if this auto state transition is not set to true, then we need to manually set it to a partner down state when there is a communication interrupted failure. And to do that, we can go to the properties of IP version 4 here. Let's go over to failover. And here's our failover rela relationship. We click on edit and we'll be able to click this button to change to partner down. This is also where we can change our load balance mode, uh, hot standby or back and forth if we want to, and set the different uh, settings for state switch interval and maximum client lead time. If we go to the properties IP version 4, go up to failover, we can see our failover relationships. So if I want to, let's say I want to add a scope to it, so I want to add this scope to that failover relationship, I can right click on it, configure failover, Click next, type in dhcp02.itviewscorp.com uh, and check this box. Reuse existing failover relationships configured with this server. I can also do it via PowerShell. I could use the add dash dhcp server v4 failover scope commandlet and specify the name of the failover relationship and the scope ID that we want to add. If I want to force replication, normally it happens automatically, but if I want to force replication between my my two DHCP servers. I can right click on my scope here and go to replicate relationship. This action replicates the configuration of all failover scopes. So if I make a change to the scope and I want to replicate that change, 
or force the replication, I can do that. Or I can right click and replicate scope. And this will give me all the information, it lets me know the properties of the scope are identical, IP address range of the scope is identical. So basically it replicates the whole thing and lets us know the process of the replication, how it went. If I want to do that with PowerShell, I can use the invoke dash DHCP server v4 failover replication and specify the computer name that I want to run it against, the name of the failover relationship, and I can go ahead and run that. Now in order to configure our failover relationship here, I'll just use the get dash DHCP server v4 failover commandlet. We can use the set dash DHCP server v4 com uh, commandlet, and that'll allow us to set like the auto state transition, enable auth, a lot of these different parameters. Also, if we wanted to create the failover relationship just with PowerShell, we can use the add dash DHCP server v4 failover, specify the computer name like we did with the GUI DHCP01, the name of the failover relationship, the partner server, the server role if it's standby, or load balance, and then the scope ID. Now if there's multiple scope IDs, we can just separate them with commas. Now let's configure split scope. So in this scenario, we're going to have some redundancy with DHCP 01 and 02, but it's not going to be because the servers are communicating with each other. We're bas basically just breaking up the address pool and giving DHCP 01 a certain number of IP addresses to hand out and DHCP 02 the rest to hand out. So I'm going to do that with our 192.168.6.0 scope. I'll just right click on it. Let's go to advanced. Let's click on split scope. So I'll go ahead and click next to the splash screen and we'll add dhcp02.itvscorp.com. Now we're going to specify how much of the address pool we want to give to our other server. So for example, if I take this to 50%, half the IP addresses will be available on DHCP01, the other half will be on DHCP02. And we can see our range here, our range is from .175 to .185. I'm going to change it. I'm going to do it 70-30 in this example. Let's go ahead and click Next. It says splitting the scope per the ratio shall result in deletion of active leases. Do we want to continue? And I'm okay with that. It basically just means some leases are IP addresses that were hand out that are going to be moved over to our DHCP02 server. Remember, the leases are not replicated when we split scopes. It's, we basically just have two separate DHCP servers, and this wizard is really just helping us set that up. So that's okay with me. I'll go ahead and click Yes. Now we can specify the delay in DHCP offer. So the host DHCP server, in our case DHCP01, the added DHCP0 is DHCP02. So if there's a delay, then the one without a delay is most likely going to be servicing most of the clients because the client will take whatever it gets first. So I'll just leave it at the default in this example, but we may want to you know, make the delay the same so that they both have an opportunity to service the clients if that's the kind of setup we want. We may have it where we just give DHCP02 like 10% of the IP addresses. Well, in that case, we'd want to put a higher delay on DHCP02, maybe like 3 milliseconds so that our main server DHCP01 is the one servicing the clients and obviously DHCP01 is down then DHCP02 will still respond it's just a couple milliseconds later so I'll go ahead and click next and finish and it was set up successfully so let's just go ahead and refresh here there's the scope on DHCP02 so if we take a look at it here, we can see it's actually inactive. So it's not uh, activated yet. So I would want to right click on it and activate it to make it so that it's actually serving IP addresses. And then if we go to the address pool, the pool is actually the same, 192.168.6.170 to 185. And if we go up here to DHCP01, we can see the pool is the same. Basically what it does is it adds an exclusion range for the other server. So this range, this range we added manually uh, in, in another movie, but this range here from dot .181 to dot .185, these are actually the IP addresses that are going to be handed out by DHCP02. If we go over here, we can see that they're the only ones available, 181 to 185, because there's an exclusion range, dot .170 to 
to dot 180 and those are the IP addresses that are going to be handed out by DHCP 01 now it's important to know that when we set this up it does create the scope options so it created that on DHCP 02 but if we have any server options it doesn't go that far we just set up the scope so you can see the server options are different on DHCP 01 versus DHCP 02 so we'd want to make sure and configure those manually if that was necessary for our scope to function properly so that's it split scopes are pretty simple now what's the advantage of using like DHCP failover over split scopes well with DHCP failover we get the advantage of being able to use the entire address pool with split scopes we're breaking it up so if there's a failure here on DHCP 01 it goes down the address pool is still very small or whatever we have set on DHCP 02 it doesn't get to take over the scope and the pool of IP addresses that DHCP 01 was using because they're really just two completely separate DHCP servers there's no communication between the two with DHCP failover there was communication between the two and on failure of let's say DHCP 01 eventually DHCP 02 could take over the entire address pool and most likely have enough IP addresses then to service everybody